As we head into chapter 22, uh, the publisher is really using this chapter to come at you from two different sides. Uh, you'll see that the title of the chapter is Performance Measurement and Responsibility Accounting, and the publisher spends a little bit of time uh, here at the beginning talking to you about um, this in particular, but let's just think about what that title says, uh, a way to measure performance and making individuals responsible. Uh, obviously, accounting is just the information that we can use to do these things. Um, and then the other side of this chapter is to talk about decentralization, and a better way to say that is departmentalization. Um, and what do we say in there? You'll see that a common way to decentralize organizations is by geography or by product line. But what about if we're thinking in terms of departments? Think about a big box store. Think about Walmart. Do you think one person can really manage every little department that's in Walmart? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, a store like Walmart can't run with just one person being in charge of, of everything and having to answer every single question. Instead, they departmentalize and they have managers in different departments. Um, and we need to figure out a way that we can account for these different departments appropriately. Some advantages of decentralization, uh, first off here, providing lower level managers with decision making authority. Um, and really that's just about making sure that everybody has some accountability, some responsibility, but look at what it does here, timely access to information. Well, that's because you're not waiting on one person to do it. Uh, enables top level managers to focus on long-term strategy. Yeah, absolutely, because now, Top-level managers are not worried about what's happening uh, every minute. They're not worried about the minutia of the company. Uh, it's good training for it provides good training for employees because it really is a bottom-up process, and of course, it boosts employee morale and retention because employees feel like they make a difference. Disadvantages, however, um, can can certainly happen. The department managers can be too focused on their own department. Everybody wants to make sure their department is the best. And sometimes I'll tell you that it's top management that makes that happen because they offer incentives or bonuses for, for being the best this month. Uh, and that can have a reverse effect. Uh, decisions of individual departments might conflict with one another. Uh, kind of that goes back to the first one, right? Departments might duplicate certain activities. If they're focused on their own department, then they really might be duplicating things that can be handled in one department alone. Um, performance evaluation, here's where the publisher's going to hit it. Uh, it's an accounting system that provides information about resources used and outputs achieved. What, what are we talking about? Well, in, in accounting, it's uh, how much money did we spend and how much money did that make us? Because it takes money to make money without a doubt. But managers use the information and performance evaluation to help control their operations and appraise their performance to allocate their resources and plan strategy. Think about the budget. If I plan to spend $500 a month on office supplies, um, am I right? Am I wrong? Is it good or is it bad? Well, I don't know. How much did I really spend? And then I'll answer that question better. But what happens is that when we departmentalize, uh, we can split departments into one of three types. We can say that a department is either a cost center, a profit center, or an investment center. And if it's a cost center, it is only evaluated on its ability to control cost. We also call cost center departments service center departments. And then profit center departments are evaluated on their ability to generate revenues in excess of expenses. So what's the difference between these two? Well, it looks like one is evaluated on revenues and another one's not. Uh, and then there's the investment center, which is kind of over there off by itself, and it's evaluated on its ability to generate return on investments. Um, so let's, but let's focus a little bit on the cost center or profit center. The investment center will come later. It's like a couple slides and, and pretty easy to deal with. But let's just think about Walmart. So if I'm looking at a profit center, I'm thinking about the grocery department, um, the auto department, um, sporting goods, menswear, ladies wear, housewares, right? Though each one of those departments can, and of course each one of those departments has its own expenses. Well, if it has revenues and expenses, I just want to make sure that they're making more money than they're spending, right? That makes sense. 
But what about a cost center? What would a cost center be or what we would call a service, a service center? And that might be the janitorial department or the housekeeping department um, in Walmart, the people who keep the store clean. They never generate a revenue. All they ever do is spend money to keep the store clean. And they need to keep the store clean because you're not going to have customers if you don't keep your store clean. So they're, uh, they're necessary. The whole store needs them. Not only does each department need them, but the whole store needs them. Another example of the cost center would be the accounting department. The accounting department never, ever, ever makes money. All we do is count the money. Uh, but of course, we do cost money because we have to employ people to run the accounting department. And we have to have computer systems and software and office supplies. So the accounting department is going to be a cost center or a service center. A lot of people don't think about this in a department store uh, like Walmart, but what about the checkout stations? That is a department in and of itself where all of the uh, cash registers are. That's checkout. That's a cost center. They don't make money there. All they do is spend money, and their job is to collect right from the money that the other departments have generated a revenue from. So that's the difference between a cost center and a profit center. Uh, still, though, focused on performance evaluation, we need to understand, again, we've talked about this a little bit before, uh, what's a controllable cost and what's an uncontrollable cost. Controllable is a cost that the manager has the power to change or to at least to um, significantly affect, right, such as the supplies used in his department. But an uncontrollable cost would be one that the manager has absolutely no control over, such as his own salary, such as uh, maybe the salary of the CEO, maybe um, the janitorial cost that is being allocated to his department, uncontrollable cost. And the point here is, is that the manager should never, ever, ever be evaluated on uncontrollable cost. He has no power over it, so you should not evaluate him on that. And that's what gets us into the responsibility accounting side of it. Again, it's an accounting system that provides information relating to the responsibilities of managers and to evaluate them on their controllable items only. Uh, this has just given you um, just the lines of responsibility, possibly the different levels of responsibility. I don't think that uh, looks like anything new to any of you. Um, you know, there was a time in accounting where this was a very flat structure. Uh, we tried to use uh, a Japanese, it was called Z-theory accounting or, or Z-theory business. Um, and it was, it was a flat structure where everybody was accountable across the board. There was no higher person or higher uh, body of leaders. Uh, we found out that it might work well for the Japanese, but it absolutely doesn't work well um, in the U.S., um, we're kind of strange over here. Our culture is a little bit different. We've got to have somebody to point the finger at, so we, we'd rather have this tiered structure. Um, so what we provide in the accounting department, obviously, is going to be responsibility accounting performance reports. We're going to give detail and or summary information to the powers that be so that they can make better decisions um, on their departments. If you look at the, the poor young lady over there on the left, she's got some really big glasses. Um, she's a department manager that receives detailed reports. By the way, I can say that because I used to wear really big glasses myself before I had to have surgery. Uh, she has very, very detailed reports. She's got lots of information to deal with over there, yet the store manager seems to have a smaller uh, level of reports. It's more summarized information from each department. This gives us an example of what's going on. Let's start, though, down at the bottom because that's the department manager's report. See that plant manager for the beverage department? Here's for July. And we've got very detailed information. We've got information about direct material, direct labor, and overhead. Those are the three product type costs. But that one manager's information is going to be reported just as one line here for the vice president of Southeast Region, as well as are some other departments and some other costs to give the Southeast Region a total. And then you'll see that the Southeast Region is then reported as one line uh, for the next level up, the executive vice president. So as you go up, those reports get much more summarized. As you go down, you get much more detailed information. All right. Uh, I think this is the last time we're going to have to talk about direct and indirect expense. Uh, when we first learned what direct and indirect expenses were, we learned that this is um, the cost by traceability. It's a way to trace cost a certain way. And we had learned back then that a direct cost, uh, if we were talking about uh, manufacturing, is a cost that is going to be 
directly linked to the product that we're creating and an indirect cost was one that we couldn't link directly to the product. It means the same thing just in a different context. A direct expense is incurred for the sole benefit of the specific department that's traceable to the department. Indirect expenses are those that benefit more than one department and are allocated among all departments benefited, just like indirect costs are in, a, in the um, in, in a product or in manufacturing. If you think about it, uh, all of the factory overhead, remember we put the um, plant manager salary there, the rent there, the janitorial team, it all went as indirect expenses in factory overhead, and then we allocated that overhead out to every product. The same thing happens in departmentalized accounting is that we are going to track all of those indirect expenses and then we're going to allocate them out across departments. And that's really the crux of the of the number crunching that we're going to deal with here. Let's talk about how we allocate, though. Um, if you've taken business math already, then you've already learned how to do this, most likely. Pretty simple to do. The example here is that Classic Jewelry pays a janitorial service $800 a month to clean the store. $800 for the whole store but management allocates the cost of the janitorial service to the three departments according to the floor space each occupies. So here you've got a jewelry store that has three departments, a jewelry department, a watch repair department, and a china and silver department. And out of the 4,000 square feet of the store, jewelry takes up 2,400, watch repair takes up 600, and china and silver takes up 1,000 square feet. The idea here is that if 4,000 feet is all of the space, thus the 100%, how much, uh, what percentage is 2,400 of 4,000? Well, that's easy math. We take 2,400 divided by 4,000 and we get 60%. 600 divided by 4,000, we get 15%. And 1,000 divided by 4,000, we get 25%. Now we just need to do the allocation. If the total cost was 800, I need 60% of 800 to figure out how much to charge to jewelry. Then I need 15% of 800 to figure out how much to charge to watch repair. And then I need 25% of 800 to figure out that I should charge $200 to China and silver. And you'll see that it's still, the math works out just right, $800 total allocated among the three departments. So that's how we always do an allocation. Doesn't have to be any more difficult than that. All right, so what happens when we have to allocate indirect expenses out? Because we deal with lots of different departments. So this is just some common allocation bases that we can see based on the types of indirect expenses we might have. And we'll allocate them differently all the time. We're never just gonna say we're gonna allocate everything across floor space occupied. And that wouldn't make sense because you wouldn't want to do that um, for utility, well, maybe for utilities, but not for equipment depreciation and certainly not for advertising expenses. It just doesn't make sense. So you'll see what some of the common allocation bases are here. All right, so now let's talk about those service departments. Service departments are cost centers. I already mentioned that on about slide number three. A service department is one that is gonna be there for the benefit of all uh, other departments and the entire store, like the accounting department and the janitorial department. So their costs are shared, indirect expenses that support the activities of two or more production departments. Like janitorial, if there's three departments, I'm gonna split that janitorial cost amongst all of those three departments. Uh, here's some commonly used bases to allocate service department expenses, such as office expenses, personnel expenses, payroll, right? You see these kind of things, and it makes sense. Maintenance expenses for floor space? Absolutely. Sounds like that should be that way. So let's go ahead and move on in then to departmental income statements. Let's see if we can figure out how we're supposed to look at this, because remember, we get um, a a profit and loss or an income statement from the store as a whole, and then we're going to have to break it out by the department. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to accumulate revenues and direct expenses, direct expenses now by department. Then we're going to allocate our indirect expenses across all departments, whether they're profit center or cost center, such as the rent and the utilities. We're going to allocate that across all of them. And then we're going to allocate service department expenses to our operating departments. What that means is that then we're going to take the sum of the janitorial department and the sum of the accounting department and the sum of the checkouts, right, all the cash registers, and we're going to allocate those totals to our profit center departments. 
and then we're going to uh, prepare a departmental income statement. So let's see if we can kind of figure this out. Just another graphic to show it. Here was step one, accumulating revenue and direct expenses into each department without allocation. It's because they're direct. I know what revenue belongs to each department, and I'm sure I can trace certain direct expenses without a doubt. And then step two was going to come down here, and we're going to allocate our indirect expenses to all departments, whether they are profit centers or cost centers, we're going to allocate things like the rent and utilities and even the janitorial across all departments. Step three is that we're then going to allocate those cost centers, those service departments like housekeeping and accounting. We're going to allocate those into our profit centers and then we're going to do income statements. Here's the example. Direct expenses, step one, trace to service departments. They skip the revenue side of it because the revenue, again, is easy. Uh, each department knows how much they make, I can guarantee. So our direct expenses are salaries and supplies. Uh, salaries uh, allocation base is on payroll, supplies is requisitions. Are we even going to allocate it? No, because uh, our human resources department has told us exactly what makes up this 20000 in each department. We didn't have to figure this out. They told us this because it's a direct expense. Same thing with supplies. Each department has submitted a requisition for the supplies. So if I total these up, I get the my organization total of 1,500. So that's pretty easy without allocation. And then step two says that we're going to allocate indirect expenses across all departments, such as rent and utilities. In this case, we've decided that we're going to allocate it based on floor space. And you'll see that it says that um, the rent is $10,000 for the company as a whole. And then we have some kind of way we know of apparently how much floor space each department takes, and we're going to charge it out. I think it'll show us here in a second. Here it is. Of a total of 2,000 square feet, the service departments, that's these two, occupy 200 square feet each. Sales department one, that's this one, occupies 600 square feet, and this one occupies 1,000 square feet. So what have we done? Well, we're going to take 1,000 divided by 10,000 to get the percentage that we should actually apply over here. Um, and then we're going to take the 600 divided by 10,000 to figure out the percentage that we should apply here. And it'll probably show us that math. Here it is. Example is 200 square feet divided by 2,000. We're talking about one of the service centers. Multiply that by the 10,000 and you get a grand. 1,000 bucks needs to go to each of these two service departments because they each, right, each of them takes 200 square feet, 200 square feet each. All right. So uh, step three, the service department total expenses then need to be allocated to the sales departments. They really uh, did kind of a poor job. I'm going to go back one. Let's, let's talk about this a little bit more. So they also allocated out the utilities the same way. Uh, again, floor space so we can figure out the percentage and knock that thousand down. But look at what happens. The service department has cost of 2200 and this service department, service department 2, has 3400 Step 3 says that we need to allocate this 2200 across these two departments, and we need to allocate this 3400 across these two departments as well. So I need to spread these out into the sales departments. And that's what we're going to do here. Uh, so it says that uh, service department one, you'll see um, its allocation base is going to be based on sales. The 2200 has now come out as a minus and pushed across these two sales departments so that service department one ends with a zero because it started with a $2200 positive that we can't see because of this, takes away the 2200 and spreads it out across these two departments. It's going to do the same thing uh, for the 3400 in a second, but let's see why how it did service department one. It said it had 40,000 in sales, and sales department two has 48,000 in sales. See, it allocates by sales. That's a total of 88. So if I take 40 divided by the 88 and 48 divided by the 88, it would give me a percentage. And that's exactly what happens. So we take 40,000 divided by 88, and then we multiply it by this 2,200, which means 1,000 must go here. And even if we didn't want to do the allocation, that means 1,200 has to go here, right? We don't have a choice. It has to go there, but I'm sure that if you take 48,000 divided by 88,000 times 2,200, it's going to give you 1,200. It's going to work the same way. 
And then you'll see here that we continued out for service department number two. We uh, zeroed out the 3,400 by allocating it out to these two departments based on an allocation base of employees. It says that sales department one has 28, sales department two has 40 for a total of 60 eight employees and if we do the math we take 28 employees divided by 68 multiply it by the 3400 and that's what gives us 1400 if I took 40 divided by 68 and multiply that by 3400 it would give me this 2000 you'll see now that these two service departments have nothing right we've allocated all of their expenses out to these two departments and increased their total expense with that, we can then create our departmental income statement. They didn't tell us about sales or cost of goods sold, so don't get hung up on that. But here's the direct expenses, and then we allocated these indirect expenses across there, and then we allocated, see what happens to the service departments? Now instead of columns, they become lines that are going across the board, and now we can see the net income for each of the profit center departments the two service uh, cost center departments, and then our organization as a whole. And it all ties out, right? If I take 7,900 here at the bottom plus 9,600, I get this 17,500. All right, uh, we want to talk real quick about the departmental contribution to overhead. And really, this is used to evaluate departmental uh, performance. We need to decide whether we should keep departments around or not. If, if we've got a department that's consistently losing money, uh, we're going to use these departmental income statements to determine whether we should keep the department around. Um, however, we need to only use departmental contribution to overhead. I'm going to back up one slide. Don't get confused. We don't want to use these numbers when we're evaluating a department as a candidate for elimination. Beca why? Because there are uncontrollable expenses in these departments. And as long as the contribution margin, the departmental contribution margin is positive, then the department is actually still feeding money to cover overhead. That's kind of the best way to say it, something you might have to play around with. So we want to use the departmental contribution to overhead to evaluate the company. How do we calculate that? Departmental revenue minus direct expenses, which means nothing indirect and none of the service department allocations are going to be considered. Let's see what that looks like. So here it is, the same information before we get down to the indirect expenses. So we're taking sales minus cost of goods sold minus our direct expenses. And now we see that these are the numbers that we actually want to evaluate our departments on. Look, uh, it's the contribution to indirect expense. Um, that we want to emphasize. If the contributions are positive, we do not want to consider them as candidates for elimination. All right, uh, we want to look real quick at uh, evaluating investment center performance. The investment center was that one all the way on the right that I said, eh, it's a little bit different. An investment center usually exists in your business office or your accounting office. And basically, they're evaluated on their ability to take excess cash or excess assets and invest them in something that's going to create a return. Uh, if they've got too much cash, maybe they're going to put it in a CD and get some interest. Maybe they're going to buy some bonds. Maybe they're going to buy some stock. Um, but that's what it's going to be evaluated on is its ability to take that excess cash or excess assets and invest it in something else and generate a revenue uh, from those investments. We're going to look at two performance measurements. One is the Investment Center Return on Assets, or ROA, and the other one is going to be the Investment Center Residual Income, or RI. Uh, here's the um, ROI, so it's Investment Center Net Income uh, divided by the Investment Center Average Invested Assets. Look at what's happening here. I've got uh, two, basically, it's two investments that we're making, right? So I have Investment Center for LCD and Investment Center for S-Phone. Um, LCD has earned 526500 when it invested 2500000 in assets. S-Phone has net income of 417600 This is the investment. This is basically the interest and or dividends earned on the investment of $1,850,000. Well, when you do this calculation, you do the division, it says that LCD, while this looks much better than this, it actually has a lower return 
based on the number of on the amount of assets it has invested. Uh, it looks like S phones doing better. If LCD had uh, put this 2.5 million over in whatever S phone put it in, uh, obviously it would have had even more income, right? Um, so while it earned more dollars, it was less efficient in using its assets. That's basically what it looks at. And then we have uh, in, uh, residual income. What we look at there is, again, the investment center net income, and we take away the target. Uh, all this is, folks, it, uh, they make it sound so difficult. All we're looking at here is the difference between what we actually earned and what we hoped to earn. Uh, it sounds like a budget, right? So the target for LCD division and S phone division was to earn 8% of its net investment. Well, um, LCD invested $2.5 million. Um, and S phone invested 1.85 million, and if you take 8% of that, LCD would have uh, made 200,000, and S phone would have made 148,000. Uh, and then if you just take it uh, away from what they actually earned, you get residual income. Uh, it really doesn't have a good comp uh, comparison factor in it at all, just to tell you uh, what the residual was you earned over what you expected to earn. Uh, we also want to look quickly at um, investment center profit margin and investment turnover. Uh, don't spend a lot of time uh, thinking about these too much, um, but just some other ways to do it. This is the ROI, return on investment. We take our profit margin by our investment turnover, and then there's a calculation to find each one of those. The profit margin is the investment center income divided by sales. Um, and then the investment turnover is investment center sales. That's this one divided by investment center average assets. Again, it's just another way to measure, to get us on a same line kind of comparison so that we can see these things and determine what's doing better. Um, Non-financial performance evaluation is something that we definitely want to take uh, into consideration. We've talked about these just a little bit already, uh, but now I want to talk to you about a balanced scorecard. And this collects information on some performances, qualitative performances, not monetary. Remember, we started when we started this semester, we said that uh, managerial accounting provides uh, monetary and non-monetary information. Here's the non-monetary piece. A balanced scorecard basically is going to use all of these performance indicators, uh, and it's going to use them uh, in in unison, really. It, it needs to look at all of these things um, in order to make this scorecard balanced to see how we're doing. It's going to look at innovation and learning. How can we continually improve and create value? This is that uh, idea of continuous improvement. Um, our internal processes, what activities should we excel in or must we excel in? Uh, do our customers see us in a good light or a bad light? Do our owners see us in a good light or a bad light? Are we making them money? So we have to look at all of these performance indicators to determine whether we have a balanced scorecard. That is going to be the end of Chapter 22.